We're used to seeing the thousands of stars in the night sky twinkling as small points, each point generally looking the same. We're used to seeing certain constellations being there, and rely on them having always been there, since the existence of the human species. However, there are many types of stars, each one with very different characteristics, and each with a finite life. Stars are continuously being born and are continuously dying. They each have a life they live with a start and an end. Stars are born from gas and dust, mainly made up of hydrogen atoms with some helium atoms. This gas is dispersed thinly over space, but in some regions atoms lie closer together. Each atom is gravitationally attracted to each other and so is pulled even closer together, creating an even denser region. This attracts more and more atoms. Eventually, it may form a large, cold cloud, which becomes spherical in shape over 10,000 years. As the atoms get closer together, their gravitational potential energy decreases and their kinetic energy increases, which makes the temperature of the gas increase. When the temperature is large enough, the gas will begin to glow very weakly. At this point, the ball of gas is called a protostar. If the ball of gas does not have enough mass because not enough atoms have been collected, that it will remain in this form for the rest of its life, only glowing dimly. Some astronomers call this a brown dwarf. The centre of the ball of gas will be the densest and hottest region. If the temperature reaches about 15 million degrees Celsius, the pressure becomes very high. In these conditions, the hydrogen atoms are stripped of any electrons and have enough energy to overcome their electrostatic repulsion and be brought close enough together with such a force that they start fusing together. At this point, the true life of the star begins. A star is born when it can start joining hydrogen nuclei together in a process called nuclear fusion. People refer to this as hydrogen burning, but it isn't burning as we know it. Nuclear fusion is a process that was discovered in the early 20th century, and experiments were first conducted in the 1930s in Cambridge but were unsuccessful and largely mocked by the science community. After World War II and the success of nuclear fission bombs, nuclear fusion research was restarted, but with a new focus of warfare. The process of nuclear fusion involves joining hydrogen nuclei together to form an end result of a helium nucleus. This process involves the release of a huge amount of energy, so it can be very destructive. A hydrogen bomb is thousands of times more powerful than an atomic bomb. The total number of explosions in World War II was only one-fifth of the power of one hydrogen bomb. During the hydrogen bomb's creation in the top-secret Manhattan Project, scientists first recognised that nuclear fusion was a mechanism used by stars to generate their energy. The process begins with two hydrogen nuclei, which are each made up of one proton, that join together to form a deuterium nucleus, a positron and a neutrino. A positron is the antiparticle of the electron, so it has a charge of plus one and will annihilate an electron if they're collided together. As you can see, the positron is needed to conserve the charge of the nuclear equation. The deuterium nucleus fuses with another proton to form a helium-3 nucleus. Two of these helium-3 nuclei fuse to form a helium-4 nucleus and two more protons. If we compare the mass of four protons with the mass of the helium nucleus, we can see that they don't match. Four hydrogen nuclei have a mass of 6.692 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, and the mass of one helium nucleus is 6.645 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The difference is 0.047 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. A tiny bit of mass has been lost. But surely this breaks the laws of physics. Mass can't just start disappearing around the universe, or would get into all sorts of trouble. One day, your whole left arm might suddenly disappear, or maybe you just suddenly not exist. As we know this isn't the case, the lost mass must be explained. And a certain scientist called Albert Einstein managed to do this. He introduced probably the most famous equation of all time, E equals mc squared. The E in the equation stands for energy, M is for mass, and C is the speed of light. This equation tells us that the difference in mass between the four protons 
and the end helium nucleus is converted into energy and released. We know the speed of light is very big, so squaring this will give an extremely large number. Therefore, a tiny amount of mass multiplied by c squared will give an enormous amount of energy. In fact, if one kilogram of hydrogen was converted to helium by nuclear fusion, the energy produced would be the same as burning 20,000 tons of coal in a power station. An important note to make is that nuclear fusion is not the same as nuclear fission. They are different processes. As we've said, fusion involves the fusing or joining of hydrogen nuclei into helium nuclei, so it involves joining lighter nuclei into heavier nuclei. Fission is almost the opposite, where heavier nuclei split to form lighter nuclei. All light nuclei up to iron can join to make heavier nuclei via nuclear fusion. However, elements heavier than iron will undergo fission instead. So, now that we know about nuclear fusion, we can see what happens next in a star. Once fusion starts, the star is no longer known as a protostar, but is called a main sequence star. A particular main sequence star is a red dwarf star. This is the most common of all stars, and is very dim with a very low mass. It transports energy from its core to the surface by convection alone. For a medium-sized star, like the Sun, the energy released from the core, where most of the fusion takes place, is typically transported outwards by photons via radiation through the radiative zone. The energy is transported further through the convective zone by convection to the surface. When the energy reaches the surface, which is called the photosphere, it is radiated out into space, enabling us to see it from Earth. In this way, we can see a star shining. The energy that travels from the core to the star's surface gives surrounding atoms more kinetic energy. The atoms start moving away from the star's center, causing the star to expand and creating an outward radiation pressure. This acts against the pull of the gravity, and for most of the star's life, the two are balanced. The star lives like this for millions or billions of years, depending on its size. What happens next depends on the initial size of the star at the start of its life. Stars will have collected different amounts of gas, so with different sizes. There are two main paths the life of a star can next take. If the star is less than four times the mass of the Sun, it is a low mass or small star. Towards the end of the star's life, it begins to run out of hydrogen fuel to fuse together, so nuclear fusion in the core stops. This means that there is no longer anything generating an outward pressure to counteract the gravitational inward pull. This makes the outer layers of the star begin to collapse inwards again. As before, this makes the temperature and pressure increase. The temporary heat creates outward pressure again and counteracts the inward force of gravity, pushing the outer layers of the star outwards. The star ends up expanding much more than it did before, and it becomes about a hundred times bigger than it's ever been in its life. It has turned into a red giant. While the outer layers of the red giant continue to expand, the core is still contracting, so the temperature continues to increase. The temperature gets high enough for helium fusion to begin, so that an even heavier element, carbon, forms. This process may take as little as a few minutes for a star similar in size to the Sun. No further fusion takes place, as there is not enough in mass to compress the carbon further to fuse together. The core remains stabilised. Large amounts of matter are ejected from the outer layers of the red giant until only about 20% of the star's initial mass remains. The star then begins to cool and shrinks until the gravitational pull is balanced by the repulsion of the electrons at the core. It stops shrinking and becomes a white dwarf, which is about half as massive as the Sun, but only slightly bigger than the Earth, so is one of the densest materials in the universe. As it can't produce any more heat, it radiates away the remaining heat for billions of years. Once the heat is all gone, it sits as a cold, dark mass called a black dwarf. A more massive main sequence star can take another path, whose end result is a bit more exciting. A larger mass star will not remain as a main sequence star as long as smaller stars. This may be surprising, as you might expect them to last longer as there is more fuel. 
However, because they are more massive, the temperatures and pressures are far greater, so the fuel gets used up much more quickly, even though there's more of it. For larger mass stars, instead of swelling into a red giant, it swells into a red supergiant, just a larger version of a red giant. The core contracts due to gravity in the same way as red giants, growing hotter and denser so that heavier nuclei can be fused. This halts the collapse as an outward pressure is produced when nuclear fusion takes place. Every time the star runs out of fuel, the core contracts, raising the temperature and pressure sufficiently for heavier and heavier nuclei to fuse. This happens until the core is mostly made of iron nuclei, which cannot fuse together. Nuclear fusion, therefore, finally stops. The star begins to collapse for the last time, with the core rising to over 100 billion degrees Celsius. The iron nuclei get crushed together, but the electrostatic repulsive force between them overcome the gravitational force, so that the collapse recoils and bounces back outwards. The final collapse and recoil all happen in less than a second, and an explosive shockwave is created. The shockwave travels through the star's outer layers, heating the material it encounters to a high enough temperature so that they begin to fuse to form new elements. In this way, all of the naturally occurring elements in the universe are created by just nuclear fusion. The shockwave sweeps material out from the star and the material is flown out into the universe in a huge explosion called a supernova. Supernovae can be observed in the sky with the naked eye because they are so bright. The youngest supernova observed in our galaxy was seen by Johannes Kepler in 1604, and Tycho Brahe recorded seeing one in 1572. The earliest record of a supernova is from 1054. This produced the Crab Nebula and was observed by Chinese astronomers. Supernovae do occur more often than the recorded dates suggest, and actually happen every few decades in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, but we don't see them because they are obscured by dust. The remaining core left over from the supernova can either form a neutron star, or, if it's massive enough, can form a black hole. A neutron star is made up entirely of neutrons, which are created due to the extremely high pressure of the remaining core. Electrons are forced to combine with protons, forming the neutrons. A neutron star is normally about 10 miles in diameter, but has 1.4 times the mass of the Sun. It's the densest known thing in the universe. One teaspoon of a neutron star on Earth would weigh a billion tons. Neutron stars spin very rapidly, turning one revolution in just seconds. They can have enormous electric and magnetic fields. Some neutron stars pulse with electromagnetic radiation. We can observe these pulses of radiation from Earth every time the magnetic pole crosses our line of sight. These neutron stars that emit pulses are called pulsars. A black hole is formed instead of a neutron star if the star was approximately 15 times more massive than the Sun. The collapse of the star would be so great that not even neutrons can withstand the high pressures. The core collapses into a singularity, forming a black hole. It is so dense that not even light can escape its gravitational pull. As nothing can travel faster than light, nothing can escape the pull of a black hole.